net zero when when i sort of you know summarize all this into like what is the problem with net zero the problem is that we are uh letting perfect be the enemy of good in effect it means that we are slowing down the rate at which carbon could be removed today because a lot of these more nature-based solutions are ready to scale tomorrow and the engineer stuff is not Welcome to The Regeneration Will Be Funded. My name is Matthew Monahan, and in this series, we're exploring the intersections of regenerative finance, technology, and our living planet. Created with Ma Earth, you can find all of our conversations and more at maearth.com. Thanks for joining us. Today's guest is Paul Gamble from Nori. Nori is a carbon removal marketplace. This was a comprehensive discussion about climate finance and carbon markets. I learned a lot and really enjoyed it. Paul is super knowledgeable about the space and he has several really potent contrarian takes which we go into. Some of the points covered by this discussion include Paul's response to the critiques of carbon credits, especially those from the media, new innovations coming out on Nori's roadmap, the motivations of carbon buyers, including the differences between voluntary and compliance, severe issues with cap and trade systems, and why nuclear fusion is such a game changer. This was an informative, sobering, and sometimes quite surprising conversation. I hope you get value from it. It was recorded at the ReFi Summit in Seattle of May 2023. Let's go, Paul Gamble. Today we are here with Paul Gamble. Paul is the co-founder of Nori. Thanks for being here, Paul. Thanks, Matthew. So what is Nori? Nori is a carbon removal marketplace. So our mission is to reverse climate change and uh, large scale carbon reductions need to happen. Um, but even if we were able to turn off all sources of carbon emissions worldwide tomorrow, mm -hmm. there's still far too much carbon in the air. And so we have to uh, remove that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, store it, sequester it. And Nori is a marketplace that is uh, building the infrastructure that makes it possible so that market forces can come together and actually scale up to the necessary size in order to remove enough carbon and um, mm -hmm. get back to uh, pre-industrial levels of carbon in the air. Yeah, and, and you've been in the space for, for some years now. How did, how did this all start for you? Yeah, back in 2015, I had been working in consulting and software product management stuff. And I wanted to work on something bigger and more interesting. And I settled on climate change because I was making a bet uh, at the time that definitely more people are going to care about this in the future mm -hmm. uh, as it becomes more severe. And as I started researching climate change, I was just wondering, like, why aren't we just pulling it back out? Like, we put it up, we should pull it back out. It seems kind of straightforward. Mm -hmm. And as I was researching this, I was finding that really no one anywhere in the world was doing that. There were a handful of things or a couple university research centers. There were a couple very early startups, um, but pretty much no one was talking about it. And so I thought, well, that's really interesting. I definitely want to work on something that a lot of people are not. Mm. Um, so I started a meetup group uh, in Seattle, where I've been um, for a long time now. And that group was to network with other people, find who was working on this, who was interested in it, and to learn things that I didn't know because mm -hmm. I come from a software background, not from like an environmental sciences background. Mm -hmm. And um, that ended up leading to um, pulling together a team of people in 2017 and founding Nori as this marketplace. Nice, great. And we're in Seattle right now. This mm -hmm. is like your backyard, but it's also the, the place where the ReFi Summit is being convened. Yeah. I really appreciated your contributions on stage yesterday at the conference. And we'll link to those talks when they're available online. How's the refi summit going for you? Uh, great. I like you said, it's uh, it's sort of surreal that um, this community of uh, mm. people, which did not exist at all, even a few years ago, totally. 
Um, the fact that the sort of flagship conference for it happens literally across the street from the apartment I lived in for nine years <laughs> uh, and across the other street from where Nori's current office is. Um, kind of weird, um, but it, it's really fun. I uh, I really enjoy it. We we now both years that it's been running, we've had mm. a big panel talking about carbon specifically, and there are some people who have been uh, mm -hmm. involved in the space for a really long time and with lots of strong opinions. And mm -hmm. I always like it when panels get a little more spicy than just you know talking about boring stuff. So yeah, um, it, it's been good. It's um, it's also fun to see that in this crypto market as. Mm. You know, things are totally different now than they were a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, there's still the same number of people here, and they're mm -hmm. still like very actively involved. Like people are really working on cool things. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and speaking of spicy, you had a spicy take. We were talking <laughs> last night, and you said multiple times, "That's the problem with net zero." And so I want to start with that frame. You know, what <clears throat> is the problem with net zero? Yeah. Well, well, first, I guess let's say what net zero is. Mm. And so. Um, we have a situation where uh, more and more uh, culturally people are looking to big companies who are often the sources of large amounts of carbon emissions to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And big companies are responding in part because they're they're made up of people who care very much about this themselves, too. Right. right, right. And uh, if you're a big company and you've been approaching this in the past, you would typically go through a process of figuring out what your carbon footprint is, you know, and they break that out into different things like what you're directly responsible for, the carbon from the energy that you use, and then carbon scope that comes. Scope one, the, scope two, mm -hmm. scope three. And then scope three is carbon coming from your supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, so generally, companies will try to first figure out, is it possible to, re to make reductions in different places? It's Qu that's probably one of the most difficult things for them to do. So it's mm. very slow going and not many have made that much progress on mm. that. And then of course, when you're talking about your supply chain, now you're talking about getting like vendors and partners to do that sort of thing. They don't necessarily have the same motivations. So you're a sustainability director at a big enterprise company and you've got this challenge of figuring out how are we going to become more sustainable? How are we going to be good stewards? Mm. And ultimately, how are we going to appeal to our customers, whether you're B2B or B2C, you are, uh, you're doing this for brand reasons. Mm. And because this is all voluntary, these are not um, uh, government mandated um, um, right. uh, objectives or, or anything like that. So what has evolved over time is a, a standard thing that companies do is they will make commitments. They will say that by a certain date, 2030, 2040, 2050 are the most common ones. They'll say we will be carbon neutral or we will be carbon net zero. Mm -hmm. Now, those terms are not actually the same thing. And it depends on who you ask, but sort of how I understand it is carbon neutral means we're um, not emitting more um, than we're or we're dealing with our carbon emissions so that we're getting to um, kind of flat. But net zero is also in some cases referring to our legacy emissions. So like Microsoft has been mm -hmm. um, probably the best in this case where they've come out and said that they want to remove all of the carbon that they've been responsible for emitting since mm -hmm. 1975. So it's kind of like a company saying, we want to get to break even and for our revenue minus cost to equal a neutral number, yeah. that would be carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. And net zero would be like paying back all of the losses and debt from the past. That's one way of looking at it. And mm -hmm. there will probably be people who watch this and mm -hmm. who disagree with these right. uh, definitions of it. Um, but net zero has sort of come out of um, it's, in, it's an accounting mindset. Mm -hmm. So you've got companies who are trying to figure out what is their precise amount that they are responsible for and then reduce and then remove uh, to get down to zero. And I say remove, which is different than offsetting, because mm. in the carbon world, offsetting has most often been used in the past to refer to projects that avoid the creation of new emissions. Mm. So when you, if you're buying offsets 10 years ago, you are you're saying I'm emitting some amount and I'm going to pay someone else to reduce how much they're emitting so that that reduction is equivalent to how much I'm uh, right. That, and that's an offset. Removals are saying, I'm going to pay someone mm. to actively pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequester it. So mm. it's literally undoing uh, the, mm. the emission that was created. 
So we've got companies that are uh, focusing on that. They're focusing on what are they responsible for and how do they get that down to zero. Mm -hmm. Now that starts leading into questions of, well, what was I actually responsible for? What is the source of those carbon emissions? Are they scope one, two, or three? And if you're talking about, let's just say scope one emissions to keep it simple, or maybe even two, uh, most often those carbon emissions are coming from some sort of fossil fuel that's being burned for energy at, in the end, like that's usually the source of it. Yeah. And uh, that carbon that's stored in fossil fuels, that is there um, underground in a very like stable uh, energy dense form right now. Mm -hmm. And we're taking it out and we're burning it and it goes up into the atmosphere and uh, it can hang around it up in the atmosphere for potentially hundreds of years. Mm. There are different ways that you can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. There are nature-based solutions, um, soil sequestration, that's what Nori works in a lot, planting trees, uh, growing kelp, mangroves. There are more industrialized engineered solutions, mm -hmm. direct air capture, carbon negative cement, enhanced rock weathering, mm -hmm. and other construction material stuff. Mm -hmm. So what a lot of these early companies that have been getting involved in this space have been doing is saying, we only want to buy carbon dioxide that is going to be permanently sequestered. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be stored down there forever. The challenge there is there is very little right. of that actually happening today. Right. Right. And so net zero, when when I sort of you know summarize all this into like what is the problem with net zero, the problem is that we are uh, letting perfect be the enemy of good. Mm. And we're forgetting, uh, we're not like zooming out and looking at it from like a broader perspective. And it totally makes sense. Like, mm. you know, the game theory would say that each of these companies are acting in their own self interest and motivation, mm -hmm. which is exactly what they should do. Mm. But th in effect, it means that we are slowing down the rate at which carbon could be removed today because a lot of these more nature-based solutions are ready to scale tomorrow mm -hmm. and the engineer stuff is not mm -hmm. and um and people are also very concerned with uh the looming threat of regulation mm -hmm. uh, whether it's just potentially having to report and disclose what their carbon emissions are or being required to reduce them to certain amounts or remove or offset or something like that and there's just this paralyzing effect mm. that this is having on the market. Um, sustainability directors who haven't necessarily been in, uh, working in this space for several years are now throwing up their hands and saying, I don't know what to do. Everything feels too risky because if we go down one path and we get dependent upon that and then regulation comes out and says to do something different. Well, now we've just we, we've got an opportunity cost and, and switching costs to deal with here. And so that's probably worse. So uh in the end right now the the desire that companies have for figuring out their precise footprints and dealing with just that mm -hmm. is slowing the entire development of the market mm -hmm. yeah well said and, and there's a lot there i think that you know we could probably critique the frame of net zero also because of this possible set of confusion of what it really even means. I mean, yeah. I've been in the climate space a long time, you've been in the climate space a long time, and we don't really even know what everyone means when they say net zero, right? No. So, and that's that's kind of the point, right? Right. Like they're, they're putting out targets that are right. 2040. Are they gonna be working in those positions as individuals? It's like a public choice theory problem. Mm. Like, I get it, uh, because this mm -hmm. is also like enormously difficult and you do have to set like a big audacious goal in yeah. order to get there. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, uh, people aren't hitting them. So, and they're not mm. necessarily being held to account because those are thing, statements that were made 10 years ago or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I don't have anyone to lobby the critique against, but the critique I would make of, of our collective approach and mindset is that we are still, um, like you said, we need to zoom out and look at what really needs to happen here. Mm -hmm. It's like um, football fields of pristine Amazon old growth rainforest being destroyed every single day, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the current rapid speed and pace of destruction under our watch of things that we know are going to be extraordinarily difficult to re-engineer and undo later mm -hmm. because they progress over time and they progress with a complexity that we we do not currently have 
in our wildest, you know, tools, yeah. the ability to recreate the complexity of highly by di diverse ecosystems mm -hmm. that have that have evolved for thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of years. Like, and it's not just the Amazon rainforest. It's like the, the deforestation that's still happening globally yeah. in places like is is you know and like conservation is kind of out of vogue well i think that there are these are all what's interesting is that there are all these different environmental problems that are happening simultaneously and they all have different um causes and there are different ways of potentially dealing with them mm -hmm. now at nori we focus exclusively very narrowly mm -hmm. on the problem of too much carbon in the air and that was an explicit choice that we made at the beginning to say mm -hmm. there are lots of different ways right and lots of different things that people could be working on and we could be working on but we want to focus on this one because very few people at the time mm -hmm. were and by keeping that narrow focus, we thought that we could be more effective. Yeah, totally. Um, but when it does come to deforestation, a lot of that is being driven by, especially if we're talking about like in Brazil, mm -hmm. a lot of that is driven by farmers who are seeking new forms of revenue uh, because the, the soy crops that they're growing are not sufficient. Right. A way that can help with that exactly. is paying them for storing carbon in their soil. Right. And so because yeah, the reality is like, I mean, we're not going to just reforest our way out of this. Like no. we need to sequester <clears throat> carbon into soils. Yes. And that is a, a very enormous problem and mm -hmm. it's squarely what you're working on. But but it's also like the, the people who are cutting down native vegetation, they're not necessarily doing it out of like malice. And totally. it's certainly not like a um, like monopoly man, evil like capitalist behind that. Mm -hmm. It's individuals who need to make money mm. and are trying to figure out ways to do it and so if we can realign those financial incentives mm -hmm. so that we get the conservation preservation outcome that we want and they can make more money mm. then people are going to do that naturally yeah so that's the kind of ethos behind what we try to do at nori right so let's walk through what your vision is for how um let's say a small scale you know landowner steward farmer um, can start to have a different pathway and an option mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, provides more of an incentive for either the sequestration of carbon or other ecological restoration and conservation. Yeah, so I'll start by talking about uh, farmers in the U.S. because right now we only have the ability to work with farmers in the U.S. because the measurement and verification problem and challenge is like a, a big one. Yeah. And even getting it to work in the U.S. took years of effort and expanding into other parts of the world is something we very much want to do and is on the roadmap. But mm. nonetheless, if you're a farmer and you are doing conventional agriculture, you're uh, planting your crops, you're putting down fertilizer, you're harvesting in the fall, and then you're plowing your field. So you leave it uh, barren and flat and empty throughout the winter. And throughout the winter, as storms come and winds blow, you watch that topsoil blow away and wash away. And that's just money go, uh, going down the drain. So what's been happening is a lot of farmers have been starting to uh, come back to much older techniques mm -hmm. of keeping that soil compacted mm -hmm. and uh, keeping the organic matter alive in the ground. You don't want to turn over the soil. We want to leave stubble in the ground. We want to directly inject seeds in the spring. Cover crops. Plant cover crops throughout the winter so you keep uh, roots in the ground, continually providing nutrients to the organic matter. That organic matter, so like microbes and fungi and other stuff, that is the carbon that's mm -hmm. being sequestered. And the more of that that's there, the less fertilizer you end up using. And fertilizer production is a source of carbon emissions. So th it has all these good effects uh, that benefit our mm. food system. We get more carbon in the ground coming out of the air and it stabilizes uh, the income streams for farms. And this is and true this is in often the US. under the banner of regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, yeah, well, and this is tr this is as true in the US as it would be anywhere else in the world. Yeah. And the real dream is um, you know, today buyers are paying um, uh, $25 a ton. 20 of that goes to farmers uh, for working in Nori's marketplace. Pricing is uh, a whole other issue, but um, 
that amount of money for a farmer in the U.S. is like pretty good and, and makes mm -hmm. a difference. Mm -hmm. That amount of money for a subsistence farmer in Brazil could be potentially life changing income. Yeah. And so the one of the goals behind Nori is creating this global marketplace because mm -hmm. the, like it doesn't matter where the carbon comes out of the air. It's a homogenous atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, so as long as the uh, carbon is coming out and staying out, we're getting the job done. And uh, wherever that carbon is removed is going to benefit the planet. Right. So what, you're, what Nori is positioned is to say, OK, mission, let's bring carbon out of the atmosphere and restore it back into the ground, back into the soil. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is to realign the economics. And so voluntary carbon market buyers are going to pay for carbon removal mm -hmm. by the ton and you're going to take, you know, 20 out of $25 a ton for argument's sake right now and give that to farmers to adopt this regenerative ag playbook with a series of methodologies and practices that's been shown and proven to sequester carbon. Mostly, except in our case, the farmers have already done it and they're getting compensated for a thing that they did. Because that's something that we also believe in is um, that like there's by by focusing on what just recently happened and compensating the farmers for that we sort of get rid of some of the challenges that have been out there in traditional carbon offsetting so they're removing the carbon and then it gets measured and verified and then that gets sold to buyers and that's for us nori like just to start when we started the so you're paying for outcomes rather than yeah. in advance for correct hey, we'll pay you this and you do X, Y, and Z. Right. It's like, no, once you've done this, we'll pay you. Yep. I see. Or we'll help you get paid. Right. And uh, that's just a start for us because when we started the company in 2017, we were like, okay, we want to be a marketplace for carbon. Mm. Where is it going to come from? <laughs> and uh, even to this day, there are still not that many companies producing any significant volumes of carbon being removed via other methods. And so mm -hmm. soil is by far the most scalable method available mm -hmm. today, even more than trees. And um, as we grow, we want to be adding more methodologies, more methods of carbon removal, because we need all of them. Um, and uh, the, the more diversity that we have, the more that we can reduce risk for our buyers and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to push back or just, I guess, press on this, this kind of notion that like the atmosphere is homogenous. It doesn't matter where the carbon sequestration comes from, mm -hmm. you know, because isn't that going to somewhat um, imply that we should just find the most efficient carbon specific ways uh, but but doesn't that re reduce the problem a bit too much just to carbon like from an ecological perspective we know there's a whole slew of issues and so mm -hmm. if we can find more holistic and integrated ways to like relocalize and to you know yield better biodiversity and water outcomes and yep. so forth like we should value those higher than just like huge monolithic industrial machines that like you know pull a bunch of carbon out of the air we have to do all of it they're, they're mm -hmm. like the scope of the problem is so enormous that we don't really have the luxury of picking and choosing mm. um, we need to remove something like 1.5 trillion tons of co2 from the atmosphere in order to get back to about 300 parts per million which is where levels were before the industrial revolution mm -hmm. and uh you know as it happens a lot of those benefits around like where the the new value is created and the impacts on local ecosystems and stuff is going to happen in the areas where people would want it to be happening anyway because that's where they have the most resources mm -hmm. available to do that mm -hmm. um but the uh, like we don't have time to wait, and and I actually do believe that it it almost is as simple as we just have to accelerate the rate of carbon removal via any method as quickly mm -hmm. as possible um, mm -hmm. across the board. Got it. Because we want to avoid tipping points too, right? Like yeah. We, we want to make sure that like coral reefs don't just like die off everywhere around the world. Right. And I guess that that tipping points you know, and the urgency that you're implying here is part of going back to like why there's problematic, why it's a problem the way we currently frame everything as net zero yeah. or letting perfect be the enemy of good. Yeah. Um, because if we sequester carbon today, 
it's a lot more valuable than if we sequester that same amount in five years. You know, sure, and and even more valuable than that is reducing the emissions today. Right. Um, which actually kind of leads me into a, another thing that I think is not a good framing, but you know, mm. it's not going to change. Is the UN talks about temperature degree targets? Right. We want to limit warming to one and a half degrees Celsius at best, and at worst, two degrees. Okay, what is aver- What is that? What totally. does that number mean? Totally. It's like um, I always make the joke, like you're trying to find an average global temperature, which is as useful as trying to find an average global phone number. It right. doesn't mean anything. Right. But we do know, and we are very, it's very easy for us to measure the amount of atmospheric carbon. Mm-hmm. We've got observatories and sensors all around the world that uh, feed together. The, um, there's one in Hawaii that we always look at. And so it sh- we should just be approaching this problem. If, if you know, if you take the politics out of it, which of mm. course you cannot, but if you were to take the politics out and you were to zoom out and say, what is the most efficient way to solve this? We would be looking at that number. What is the current parts per million? Today it's like 420 or so. Mm-hmm. And we would just be uh, saying, we need to remove more carbon until it gets down to 300. And mm-hmm. all of our actions need to be moving towards that direction. Mm-hmm. And this is the power of useful metrics. And I, I wish more people focused on this metric. I mm-hmm. think it's far more important than temperature, um, mm-hmm. but that's not the way that the um, the cookies crumbled. I completely agree, though. I mean, temperature is a second order effect of mm-hmm. the carbon in the atmosphere, and we don't know what kind of gyrations the planet is going to go through from a temperature perspective. Yeah that may also be affected by a lot of things that aren't just about the carbon, Yeah. right? So I think if we can just agree on parts per million as the barometer, um, it makes a lot more sense because Mm -hmm. it's more direct. um, And of course, it's only one ecological measurement. Like there's other things that we need to be looking at as well. Mm -hmm. So you said just now, like we can't remove the, the politics and, mm-hmm. and, and yesterday uh, on stage, you said that the biggest challenges are political. What, mm-hmm. what did you mean by that? Well, right now, going back to when I was talking about how like sustainability directors of companies are paralyzed, a lot of it is because they don't know uh, how to judge or measure uh, the actual effects of things that they're paying for. Mm-hmm. And they're concerned about the looming threat of regulation. Mm-hmm. So. There are a number of different um, standards bodies out there that are privately run, um, that are purporting to be authorities on defining what is good and what is not. Mm-hmm. But the, the the winds of that can change swiftly because mm-hmm. even recently we've seen Vera, which is the, by far the most well-known carbon offset registry, getting dragged through the press for mm-hmm. um, uh, issuing carbon credits for projects that really shouldn't have been. Mm-hmm. Now, that's actually a position that we at Nori have been taking for a very long time, mm-hmm. and that's why we didn't choose to work with them and uh, chose to develop our own methodology ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, th- th- uh, if you are a, um, you're approaching this um, for, as a sustainability director, like the reputation of mm-hmm. what you are doing matters right. far, far, far more than any sort of financial risk that you're taking. Right. I've been told this directly by sustainability directors who say, I am far more concerned about a, an investigative reporter showing up and saying, hey, you know that like forestry project that mm. you paid for? Forest isn't there anymore. Um, and that's happened a lot of times. Mm. So uh, that threat and that risk is out there. And in order to get uh, buyers comfortable with that, they they need they need some sort of like collective narrative approval because no one no one's actually sure about anything, right? But all that they're all that is like most effective or what they need is just to know that they're not going to be judged for their mistakes by others because if others are making the same mistakes, then it's okay. So that's what I mean by it's it's like political and it's yeah. narrative driven yeah. and um, it's just humans being humans. Yeah. Uh, not very rational, but that's we're not. So, yeah. And it's interesting because like Vera got attacked so vociferously, it almost felt like the way that, you know, Facebook might be attacked for leaking hundreds of millions of, yeah. you know, accounts or something, except Vera's like a tiny organization, you know, I mean, it's like in the grand scheme of things, it's what, 100 people, mm-hmm. uh, you know, $20 million of revenue or right. something like that. Yeah. I mean, this is not like the big bad behemoth corporations, right. like it's a fairly small boutique, 
still, you know, clearly was is out front in the carbon credit space. Yep. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, legitimate reasons why the critiques were being lobbied. But why do you think that the attacks have been, um, you know, like the Guardian going after Vera, the way that that all ensued? Like, do you have any kind of, I guess, commentary or theories of why carbon credits are being targeted <laughs> like this? Well, one potential cause is the moral hazard argument. So uh, it's been it's reasonable um, that this is the question of if companies have the ability to remove or offset their emissions, are they going to decarbonize? Mm -hmm. And I said a couple of times here that it's more important that you decarbonize mm -hmm. first. And like our tagline at Nori is emit less, remove the rest, because mm. car it's it's a lot more expensive and risky uh, to remove carbon that to emit carbon and then remove it than it is to just not emit it in the first place. Right. 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 Um, and so when you've got big companies out there making claims and we see it, right? Like mm. you, you buy all sorts of products, um, you buy stuff online, everyone's saying like carbon neutral, they're slapping labels on things. And like, you know, the honest truth of it is like most of it is garbage mm -hmm. and they're not, at, but they're, again they're doing the best that they can mm. and trying to sort through this very confusing space and like i have strong opinions but i've been working in this directly and mm. i have you know i have skin in the game mm -hmm. uh for uh seven or eight years now um that's not necessarily the case for right. uh people making decisions of that um anyway why is the guardian and, and others going after it well we also just live in an era where everyone's looking for the villain and everyone's mm. looking for scapegoats and to explain why things are bad. And it's mm. e when you see something like that happening, it's easy to cast blame. And we just get, you know, mob mentality is a thing that happens a lot on the Internet now. So mm -hmm. I think all those factors kind of roll up together uh, yeah. to do it. But I will say Vera probably deserves it. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to be hypocritical. Like, I've certainly spent my share of breath critiquing carbon credits in New Zealand, mm -hmm. um, where there's a fairly robust emissions trading scheme that's been established for several years, mm -hmm. and it leads to all sorts of unintended, perverse yeah, outcomes and consequences. started on cap and trade schemes and how, yeah. how awful those are. Yeah, it, it's... It, you know, in the case of New Zealand, close to home for us, it has to do with how it incentivizes these invasive pine trees oh, that aren't mm -hmm. nearly as ecologically sound as reforesting back into permanent native forests. Yeah, mm -hmm. And the way that the combination of carbon farming and forestry lobbies have tipped the scales um, so that the, the tables that measure the carbon, you know, way disproportionately benefit Absolutely. these species that make no sense for the yeah. landscape. Yep. And, you know, because we can't measure the underground carbon as easily, mm -hmm. there's zero treatment of it. Mm -hmm. And so you also have, you know, pristine farmland that should stay farmland being converted into, you know, foreign owned absentee landowner, you know, monocrop pine plantations. Yep when that could be food resilience and mm -hmm. you know regenerative agricultural practices or you have what should be native forest yeah. uh, you know being turned into these these pine plantations because yeah. oh in 20 years this much carbon da, 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 da. and yeah. so i certainly have my share of criticism of the whole schemes as well but i guess it's just yeah you said to me last night like it's it's probably a step back for the space because if we've shaken the confidence so much mm -hmm. of the buyers, you know, the corporations are, are you know, the, they they're up. just kind of freezing up. Yep. Yeah. And uh, and again, like the, what you just described, the, a very similar thing happens in California with their cap and trade scheme. And um, again, the the motivations of the people who put these programs in place are good. Totally. But they made bad decisions. Yeah. And, or didn't go far enough, or it was just too simplistic. Yeah, and and they're not thinking about the realignment of incentives. I think I mean, ultimately, a lot of stuff just com comes down to poor incentive design. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, like you, what you're describing is there is now an incentive for uh, investors to come in and do this thing because it can make money, but that's not actually what's best uh, for the land. Um, so uh, it's 
Yeah. It, it comes down to incentive design and not enough people are thinking about that. Yeah. And I guess, you know, some people watching us discuss this would probably be like, well, why the hell are you guys even bothering then? Like, don't keep going further and try to keep over financializing and over instrumenting mm -hmm. and trying to, you know, create new credit classes and, you know, token design and da da da. Like, take a step back. We need a whole scale, completely different approach. What, what would you say to that? Well, I probably agree with some sentiment of that. Um, I do think that a lot of, especially the crypto um, carbon uh, products have gone too far mm -hmm. in uh, focusing on fungibility and liquidity and tradability because like the having the ability to create carbon credits is not the actual problem. Mm -hmm. The actual challenge is there's not enough carbon coming out of the air and it's really difficult to measure it when mm -hmm. it is coming out of the air. Mm -hmm. So that's what people need to be spending their time and effort on. Right. And I just don't believe that carbon should be traded, period. I understand why that developed in that way. And like a, a brief history, if you'd like, is please uh, when the Kyoto Protocol was adopted in 1997, uh, something that came out of that was the creation of the Clean Development Mechanism, the CDM at the UN level. That wasn't a carbon market, but it was rules for a framework for how you could build carbon markets. And uh, that led to the creation and development of these offset registries like Vera and Gold Standard and Climate Action Reserve and so on. And you started getting like early transactions between buyers and sellers. And uh, the if you were doing a carbon offset project, you were coming at it more from what is the actual hands on the ground or you know, boots on the ground um, uh, project that you're doing and then you would uh, work with typically a broker who's then going to take those carbon credits that are issued by the registry and then going to sell those to someone else. The broker might sell it to another broker who then thinks that they can then get a better sell. So it starts naturally, right? Like it makes sense that you would have a broker do that. Like you don't necessarily have a business mm. development team and mm. you're not thinking about it like a business that's going to focus on sales. You just want to like do the carbon project. So brokers step in to fill that gap, but then that leads to brokers selling to other brokers. And now at that point, like mm. after that first sale, the original project developer was already paid. And if we're thinking about this from an incentives perspective, we want more people to remove more carbon from the air, period, right? So that's, and th this is like the core ethos behind Nori. So if you want more people to do something, you gotta pay them to do it. So it's about creating that financial incentive to pull carbon out of the air. But when you have a carbon credit that is trading hands over and over and over and over again, you've totally reduced that incentive. And what you have incentivized is middlemen to come in and totally overly financialize a product. And it's it's totally inefficient. It's bleeding out money. Like w I believe very strongly that every new dollar spent on carbon removal should result in net new carbon coming out of the air. And so when we started Nori from mm -hmm. the day one, we decided we were not going to facilitate the trading of carbon. So mm -hmm. the, when the carbon is bought by the end buyer in our marketplace it is immediately retired. And we actually do that by recording it on chain as an NFT that becomes non-transferable. So it's very easy to show and prove that this is done, that this wallet owned by this entity owns this carbon now. Yeah, got it. And such a hugely important point. So let me summarize if I understand correctly and you can you know, let me know if there's anything that needs to be revised. So I'm a land landholder, steward, owner. I want to reforest a section and I need to go get financing and funding for that. Mm -hmm. You know, let's go plant trees. Or I want to um, get paid for sequestering carbon on my farm, right, into the soil. Microsoft over here is like, great, there's a certain amount of our footprint that we cannot reduce. Mm -hmm. You know, the servers need electricity and we're doing our best to decarbonize our company. But in order to really achieve net zero or to neutralize the carbon impact that we have, we need to go pay for carbon being reduced out of the air into the ground or into the trees yep and so microsoft is out here and other corporations and other businesses and so forth looking for projects to fund that removal mm -hmm. these projects over here do that in order to make that kind of marketplace work there naturally arises intermediary brokers those brokers are like, hey, we're going to help match buyers and sellers because Microsoft, you don't have time to go talk to every single farm. Hey, farmer, forester, you don't have time to go talk to the corporate sales teams over at Microsoft. Da, 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 da. And so we have these natural 
intermediary actors that emerge in a market. Part of that, though, is that those intermediaries start to also trade with one another. You go, oh, okay, well, you need a debt facility, and so we're going to pay, you know, da 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 da, and like, oh, you know, we cover the United States, but now we're going to farm out to a different entity, the Canadian operations, and da 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 da, mm -hmm. and then here comes, for lack of a better term, Wall Street. You know, mm -hmm. the, the derivatives traders, the commodity traders that, oh, we understand how this works. We do the same with soy and, you know, corn and mm -hmm. all these other commodities and gold and so forth. Yep. Great. Whole new asset class emerging. <clears throat> Let's call it carbon. Mm -hmm. And now we can speculate and trade and mm -hmm. try to create derivative products and do all of these other financial engineering mm -hmm. gimmicks on top of it. Um, because at that point, it's just abstracted. Yeah. And but the reality is that all of that activity that you're referring to, like if it doesn't actually net net reduce carbon, mm -hmm. we're missing the point. Right. And so let's not do all of this trading nonsense. Let's actually just make sure that when credits are bought or originated and then purchased, that they're retired. And so Microsoft can say, OK, great. We have now retired that ton of carbon. It's gone back into the soil. This is all stored on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. In Nori's case, um, Nori can prove and verify using its methodology and transparency of the ledger to say this is what actually got done. And this is not a credit to be traded in some commodities desk in London. Yeah. And now, now to, uh, yes, you got that all totally correct. Um, but I, I do want, <laughs> I do think it's important to note that like it is important to have commodities markets for anything that you want to grow to any sort of significant size. Right. We just shouldn't be trading the carbon itself. Got it. We need some sort of What's other that distinction. Help me understand that distinction. Well, the, the carbon itself. Um, well, you can potentially trade contracts on carbon, uh, you know, future delivery, uh, mm -hmm. something like that. That could make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, but when you are trading the underlying carbon itself, you are uh, you're removing that financial incentive. And it's just it works differently because there isn't like a consumable like bushel of corn at the end of the day. Mm. And um, the carbon's already been removed mm. and sequestered and just needs to stay there. Mm -hmm. So the end buyer should be consuming it uh, when that happens. But we do right. need some other uh, assets, financial assets that can be traded, just not that actual carbon itself. Right. Are there other examples of commodity markets that feel more like carbon where it should be essentially consumable rather than like the delivery of a barrel of oil or a bushel of corn? No, not that I'm really aware of. Interesting. Yeah. And, and so this is kind of, I guess, points to do you, do you have any view if this is like an entirely new class of ecological commodities that is emerging? Yeah, I, it's something it's something new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it which sort of reflects the the challenge of what Nori has been working on for six years now is creating this like new way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I think people are uh, open to this type of concept because it doesn't make sense. When I explain to people like w every new dollar, totally. new, new carbon, that lands with people and that makes a lot of sense. So yeah. um, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate those distinctions in helping me understand it. And I, I guess just to contradict a bit of the spirit of my critique of the London, you know, Wall Street, like mm -hmm. usually when I see new financial derivative or vehicle products being constructed, they actually, there's some sort of element of of real legitimacy and truth of why we needed it. Yeah. You know, it's usually because like someone in the marketplace needs some sort of new access to a pool of liquidity or capital or financing or whatever in order to do what they need to do. Yeah. And so I don't think that this is just like. And that's true here too. Like totally. often financing is a, a major blocker for getting new carbon. Removal How are you going to get the money to pay for the activity mm -hmm. that you're going to do? You know, yep. we need to be able to bring that capital forward mm -hmm. in, in time um, to finance these things. And like, why wouldn't we want, um, you know, an investment fund to mm -hmm. get 10% per annum on their money mm -hmm. and choose that over some other less productive Right. you know, less valuable to the commons activities, um, why wouldn't we want them to spend that money 
doing regenerative ag or reforestation or conservation or whatever. You know, like if we can align our economic system with the behaviors and activities that we need to take, it's better for everyone. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Um, so I guess this somewhat leads to Web3, and we've kind of touched on it a bit, but I'd like to, I guess, ask you more directly, like, yeah. where do you see blockchain, crypto, Web3 kind of like in this space, and why is Nori so much a native Web3 company? Uh -huh. <clears throat> well, from the start, it's about having that provable, transparent ledger. Like, the role that the offset registries like Vera have played in the past is their databases of serial numbers in addition to developing the protocols that are used to measure. Um, mm. And by putting this on chain in an open, transparent way, and you have right. like totally open accounting on that, it just becomes a lot clearer and easier. Mm. And especially because we are doing the immediate retirement, it's it's trivially straightforward to make an NFT non-transferable and have that thing represent it. I think another aspect is the ability to just ride the wave as mm -hmm. uh, cryptocurrency and um, uh, just like blockchain financial applications are becoming more and more of a backbone. Like to me, it's obvious that mm -hmm. um, like Ethereum is going to be the financial backbone of the internet. We've heard yeah. people say that a lot before, right? Yeah. Uh, so if that's going to be the case, then we want to have this be crypto native from the beginning mm -hmm. so that this can be incorporated because our goal is not to be a like carbon offset broker who is just trying to find like big enterprise buyers mm. for carbon removal because that's not sufficient. Even if we totaled the entire carbon footprints of the Fortune 500 companies, okay. and even if they went above and beyond, like, you know, they're just trying to do neutral mm. stuff, which isn't going to pay down the carbon debt of that 1.5 trillion tons. But even if they did, it's still not as a drop in the bucket. Mm. This has to be widely distributed in, in, in the way where um, the same way that we uh, just handle like garbage collection at the municipal level, like we don't really think about it. We just know that it has to happen. And if you go to a restaurant or a store or something and you create some sort of waste, you just throw it in a trash bin mm. and then they're going to they're going to deal with it mm. as the cost of doing business. You're not going to mm -hmm. see a garbage removal line item on your bill at the restaurant at the end of the meal. Carbon used to be the exact same way. Right. And so this has to be distributed into that and just makes a lot of sense to use cryptocurrency. Now, our buyers are able to pay in either traditional cash. We can invoice them. They can pay with credit cards mm. or they can pay um, via like a stable coin right now on chain. So mm. we're not going to force them into that. But right. by making this native, we're accessing uh, large pools of um, buying power, but also the ability to integrate with more and more applications in the future yeah and that statement which i agree with that it seems obvious that ethereum is going to become the backbone of the new payment system mm -hmm. um for someone that's watching this that may be coming more from a climate finance or carbon lens mm -hmm. and less um experienced or in the weeds on web3 yeah um can we unpack that a bit? Like, why do you? Why does it feel obvious to you, having been in this space now for several years, mm -hmm. that Ethereum and Ethereum-like, you know, blockchains are going to be the future? Have you ever tried to send money across borders? <laughs> it's really freaking hard, <laughs> and it takes a long time. And you're not sure that it's even going to get there until it does. Have you tried sending like stable coins to someone at, in some other location in the world? Mm -hmm. Like, it settles in 15 seconds it's a lot easier mm -hmm. and it's a lot clearer. It's a lot more transparent and it's a lot more trustworthy. Mm -hmm. You don't have to depend upon third parties. Think of how many times, how political things have gotten in the last few years where payment processors are blocking certain types of payments like the, the, um, or, or, or banks too, like the, the trucker protests in Canada, that was tyrannical. Uh, mm -hmm. what the, uh, Trudeau government did. And so they were able to use the arm of government to prevent uh, financial transactions that absolutely should have been able to go forward. And so with crypto, uh, you have the ability to do this in a much easier way. Mm -hmm. and, and it can't be stopped by authoritarian governments who are acting badly. And I think for people, especially living in the US and the developed West, who mm. we generally have like pretty good 
laws and property rights and contract law and all that sort of stuff. And so we, we, we just sort of take it for granted that those mm -hmm. systems work. It's not the case in the rest, in the most of the world. Um, so it's, uh, while we don't necessarily need crypto uh, to run economic transactions in the US, a lot of the world does. And that means that to me is why it's so obvious that this is going to uh, become mm -hmm. like the backbone of everything in the future. Mm -hmm. And how does it feel to be an American, an American company and to see so much regulatory vitriol, at least in the headlines mm -hmm. against the space and the uncertainty. I mean, it's, I think, fairly well established that we're seeing a lot of Web3 founders ship out overseas, yeah. away from the United States, uh -huh. start entities outside of the country. We spoke with someone this morning, you know, he's basically seen the drain happen before his eyes mm -hmm. uh, from an investment lens. You know, I'm curious, yeah, how does that land for you? It's really unfortunate and it's uh yeah, it just sucks um i've i got into bitcoin in 2011 so i've been here since nearly the beginning and i've watched mm. this entire thing evolve and this is by far the worst uh mm. that the regulatory environment has ever been i've met with uh um, sec commissioners i've met with cftc commissioners I've spoken to uh the staffs of, of um, important members of congress about this stuff the issue, ha like every other issue in American politics, has become extremely polarized and partisan, and it, it mm. shouldn't be. Right. Um, so uh, it's, it's sad, and I think the only way that anything changes is with a change in power in D.C. That's, I don't see a compromise happening anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like from a mimetic perspective as we kind of frame these discussions you know we talked about like the framing of net zero the mm -hmm. framing of temperature like what about with the framing of web3 or crypto or like you know and obviously like we're just starting this like media interview series and it's fairly niche and we don't expect to be like changing the mainstream perceptions <laughs> yeah. of crypto but i am curious do you have any thoughts of just like ways that we can do well as a as a community around web3 to tell stories and craft narratives that help to either depolarize or to capture the enlivenment and imagination of what's possible here. I think it just comes down to building tools and applications that solve pro real problems for people. Mm. And like, frankly, there's not enough of that. And mm. there hasn't been at any point um, in the development of crypto stuff. Um, during his keynote yesterday at Refi Summit, Kevin Awaki, who has a book called Green Pill that came out last year, where he talks about different aspects mm. of this, like we can use these tools to solve social problems. And that was what attracted me to the Ethereum community initially in 2015 was Same. like, I was coming out of Bitcoin and that that culture was extremely toxic. You know, we mm. had like the block size debates and, and all of that. And um it was just not good and then all of a sudden you've got these do-gooders mm -hmm. with the ethereum space who are talking about building programmable money yep. that you can use to solve large-scale social problems and that's ultimately what led to me wanting to work on nori in this way um so i i think that especially in mm -hmm. dc if we're talking about regulators who again are well-meaning and also have laws in the books to enforce uh they were really burned by ftx like really 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 badly mm. and while for those of us who are in the crypto space to say well that has nothing to do with crypto like obviously that was mm. just a fraudster con man mm -hmm. um who the the product that was on their platform happened to be crypto but in fact if you had applied the actual principles of decentralization and you know not your keys not your coins sort of thing that wouldn't have happened in the first place mm. because we would have had totally transparent and auditable books and you wouldn't have had the commingling of funds blah 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 but because he had been uh, particularly glad handing mm. with one party in dc that party is now totally burned by it and wants nothing to do with crypto and is actively opposing it mm. we have elizabeth warren um talking about her uh wanting to build an anti-crypto army yeah. in a campaign ad yeah so it's politics all the way down. It's yeah. stupid. Um, mm. And well, American politics is stupid. So, yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Like my heart goes to teams like yours where you know you have to make the math work and you have to find the market and you have to like you're, you're building tools and you, you're in the game yeah you know and i'm like a little bit on the outside of the game watching and and yet you know whilst i have a lot of like compassion for the difficulty that it presents to both groups in the carbon space or groups in the climate and the crypto space mm -hmm. with kind of this simultaneous like challenging yeah you know kind of uh, crypto winter, you know, regulatory crossfires environment, plus like, you know, critique of carbon credits and, you know, Vera changing and all of these things. Like, I do get even more excited about the intersection as a result of what's happening, because mm -hmm. to me, it feels like it's cleansing the system of, you know, it's forcing us to get clearer about the integrity of yeah. these carbon credits. And it's also... Um, yeah, it's just like cleaned out a lot of the noise and the casino shenanigans of the last bull market in 2021 yeah. um, and the FTXs and so forth. Like, yeah, good riddance. Like, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm there's excited. so much of that. It, it's, yeah. it's exhausting for us, too. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. It's just hate, noisy. And yeah. I hate when I see those things because then there's also like pressure on us to like right. stoop to their level right. in order to be successful in the markets and in business. And it's really difficult to resist that. And we've mm. always done our best efforts to do so. Yeah. Um, and and frankly, this I think this behavior is going to continue until Congress does its job. Like the problem we have today, like mm -hmm. you have a bunch of um, hopefully well-meaning regulators mm -hmm. uh, acting to try to enforce you know, their interpretations of laws on the books. Mm -hmm. But the laws on the books were written in 1933. And so we need something new mm -hmm. uh, from Congress. And there are a lot of members of Congress who are quite interested in this on both sides of the aisle who do want to create this. So anyway, it's Congress's job to define this uh, yeah. for us. And until Congress does that, um, we're going to continue to see these unfortunate cycles. And uh, we just have to do our best to try to stay alive through them. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably going to be noisy and frustrating for a, a while longer. But I do feel like structurally, I mean, even though you said that the regulatory environment is probably the worst you've ever seen it, mm -hmm. I felt like in 2012 that the question was like, will they ever allow crypto to survive? Like, mm. because the idea of printing your own currency was pretty well established to not be okay. Yeah, I remember like the Liberty Dollar, like gold coin stuff from- Totally. Yeah, those cases. You know, yeah. and so like, would crypto ever be allowed or would it like fall the way of like online gambling <clears throat> in the United States, which yeah. was just like squashed for, for some time. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, I feel like we kind of got past that, mm -hmm. even though, you know, now it's like with the SEC commissioner, you know, unwilling to commit to Ethereum being a commodity or security or blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know, implicit in that is like, well, OK, we're allowing for crypto commodities like Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, like it's feels fairly because your hand's been forced. Right. The, it's too valuable now. There are too many. There's too much skin in the game by with by too many powerful institutions and people. Exactly. And so that's the only reason that it survived until this point. Like if you had the same level of attention and. Uh, right. Uh, uh just like resources being devoted to it back in 2012 yeah it would have died in totally time. but you, and now you have you know jurisdictions like the uk and dubai and singapore mm -hmm. and even hong kong like getting clearer and clearer about welcoming regulatory environments yeah that make the rules of the road really clear for and they benefit from the businesses that go start there and the investments that come in and their local economies benefit from that and that's why it would be the best if the u.s would do take a similar approach like we're we want we just want clarity everyone right. always says this yeah okay so uh, enough politics i i do want to ask is are there anything on the Nori roadmap, mm -hmm. any innovations or new things you're working on that you're excited about? Yeah. So I've talked about how we, we work with farmers who uh, sequester carbon in their soils. Our product for that is called the NRT, the Nori Removal Ton. And what we've been seeing is a lot of companies out there are looking for carbon removals that are of the more permanent variety, mm -hmm. um, sequestering for hundreds, thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, because it's it's uh, going back to what I was saying earlier, it's sort of a like for like. You're creating emissions coming out of fossil fuel based stuff. That carbon was securely stored. You want to put it back in a secure storage with soil carbon or with trees. It's a much like 
potentially rap, more rapid. I mean, it's on like a human lifetime, like maybe like a hundred years, 10, 10, between 10 and a hundred years or so. Mm. You might expect that carbon to like cycle back through. That's just like the normal natural carbon cycle that's yep. been going on earth for a long time. Um, what we are looking at now, especially as companies are trying to make net zero claims and commitments, when they're doing so, they are pre-purchasing permanent carts. Let's just use direct air capture as an example. They're mm -hmm. pre-purchasing DAC carbon removals that are going to be delivered in like five plus years time. And they're saying, well, you know, we're we're committed to doing that. So they're mm -hmm. pre-purchasing it. So, so just to make sure everyone's following. So direct air capture being kind of like we build this machine that sucks carbon out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We're not really there yet to do that at scale yet. But right. we're kind of forecasting that, you know, over the next five years, we're going to be able to do this. And so companies can pre-purchase yeah. the carbon removal from that methodology, yeah. which is more permanent because it's not going back into the natural carbon cycle. They'll, they'll take it uh, out through the DAC machines and then they will inject it into underground wells and reservoirs and it'll mineralize, turn into like calcium carbonate and that sort of thing. Right. So it, you turn it into rock basically and right. it uh, then is stored for a very long time. Right. Um, <clears throat> we need both. Uh, and so what we're, what we've been looking at is blending these two things together. So a blended ton where we combine our NRT from the soil carbon mm -hmm. at, with a, uh, a future delivered ton, um, from some DAC supplier or something like that, mm -hmm. pair these things to these together so that if you're a buyer and you want to be making net zero claims, you're mm. actually having impact today because carbon was removed in the soil mm. and you're getting that permanent like lock in uh, as the mm -hmm. carbon gets delivered in the future. We haven't seen anyone do this yet. Yeah. Um, and I think that we're really well positioned at the moment because right. we have a partnership with Bayer, Bayer Crop Science, who are working with um, hundreds of thousands of acres, farmers across the U.S. who are adopting regenerative ag practices. So we mm. we now have access to enterprise level scale on mm -hmm. the supply side when it comes to soil. So start pairing that with some of these um, coming down the pike, uh, mm -hmm. uh, more permanent stuff together. And now we've got like an actual product that is beneficial to everyone mm -hmm. and is giving these net zero companies what they need. Because even though I don't like net zero and I don't think it's an efficient way of actually solving climate change, mm -hmm. it is what the market is doing. And so we do have to respond yeah. to it. Yeah. And I want to ask you about that because it's clear in speaking with you that, you know, the integrity of the work is really important to you. Mm -hmm. You know, you're clearly in it for that reason. And yet you're having to interface with a system that's flawed and corporations that are doing this for marketing purposes. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, how do you ensure that this doesn't just become greenwashed or, um, you know, basically taken advantage of um, in a way that benefits the large scale corporations mm -hmm. and doesn't actually get to the results we're, we're all trying to get to. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about that internally. I think a lot of it is framing around um, if you are if you're paying for soil carbon, that's not necessarily going to be like 100 percent equivalently offsetting carbon emissions that are coming out of fossil fuels that you're burning. Mm -hmm. But it, it what it does do is it it does help pull carbon out of the air and it buys us time collectively as civilization to build up more capability for larger scale and more permanent types of carbon removal. Mm -hmm. So uh, another way that I think about it is like there's permanence, but there's also throughput. And uh, what is what is our capability of carbon removal today across all the different methodologies? Mm. It's, it's probably in the um, tens of millions. Mm -hmm. And what we really need to be getting to is like the UN is calling for something around 10 billion tons a year by 2050. I think that's like a really weak goal and they need to be shooting for much, much higher mm. uh, than that by then. But people at the UN don't think about like exponential innovation curves. So I you know, forgive them. Um, so we need to be gigaton scale very quickly, and that needs to be continually growing. Long term, by the end of the century, I think we've got like a massive carbon removal industry that is just going to continue to run like mm -hmm. this. Like we're we're never going to get to it's a just point. the waste disposal yeah. industry yeah. in a new form. It's not like garbage is going away right. anytime soon. Like we manage it now, mm -hmm. and it's going to be the same for carbon. We're um, and because I'll also think of it like. Uh, a lot of people, like I think McKinsey or or some um, some consulting group, has uh, yeah. put out a paper ex anticipating carbon removal to become a trillion dollar industry. 
that's not going to just shut down right. when we get back to 300 parts per million. Right. Um, so uh, what, what's going to happen is we're going to pay down our carbon debt. We are going to get back to 300 parts per million. We're going to hopefully avoid the worst tipping points uh, mm -hmm. in, by doing this as rapidly as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're just going to continue steady state from then on. And that's just the way it's going to be for the rest of the time that civilization is on Earth. Mm. And there will be obviously like peaks and valleys of yeah. what the carbon pricing and those markets mm -hmm. look like. But, but effectively, this is a new set of financial instruments to afford yeah. this new problem space and solution space. Think of it like um, we are, we're, we're trying to uh, um, push out the, the time, extend our runway so that we have more time to uh, build this stuff out. And um, and you know markets will adjust to that too. But also you know something like really important that's coming uh, coming very soon, probably within ten years or so, is commercial scale fusion energy. Mm -hmm. And when we have that, all of these problems become much easier to solve mm -hmm. because like direct air capture, for instance, it uses an enormous amount of energy mm -hmm. and that has to be done in a carbon neutral way in mm -hmm. order to scale up. Um, when we have fusion energy, it'll be trivially, um, well, uh, essentially cost effective to produce jet fuel out of atmospheric carbon. It's not we're not going to see uh, jumbo jets flying on batteries anytime soon. There is like really cool electrification work going on, but it's not anytime right, soon. Right. So uh, it's again, it's about uh, increasing our optionality, extending the runway mm. uh, and avoiding the worst tipping points. And so the, the best way to do that is by increasing throughput, which means scaling up as many different methods of carbon removal that we can today. And mm -hmm. by far the most scalable methods available to us are nature based. Right. So what you're saying is that they're nature based and you're sitting on all of this opportunity to move soil and carbon through these farms that you have partnerships with through Bear, and in the future, obviously, other, you know, mm -hmm. farms um, and what this idea of a blended ton instrument is, is this combination of that removal, which can happen today, mm -hmm. um, as well as these future methodologies like direct air capture, which aren't really quite ready for the kind of throughput and scale. Um, but by giving them forward financing and by giving them free commitments, mm -hmm. it allows for them to build the infrastructure yep. and to bring those technologies into practice. And I guess the ecologist in me still has this like slight aversion to why would we spend money scaling up unproven technologies that are fairly narrow mm -hmm. when you're acknowledging that like the the answer is nature-based solutions today and so forth and what you're saying is like this is what the market's asking for it's it's that plus nature-based solutions are not sufficient to meet the scope of the problem so we emit roughly about 50 billion tons of co2 every single year that's including like all other types of greenhouse gases mm. And uh, if we're going to get down to 300 parts per million, we need to be reducing that 50 down to a much lower number and then removing more than that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's say uh, that across all of the different nature-based methods, soil, tree planting, kelp, uh, you know, and also there are a lot of challenges around knowing for sure if these are truly scalable yet, um, like, like kelp, um, mm -hmm. at most, we're talking about 15 billion tons, 20 billion tons. And that's like, that's the total addressable market. That's like all resources of planet Earth are devoted to doing this sort of thing. Mm. That's not gonna happen, obviously. So it's gonna be mm. a smaller number than that. And so if we want to be actually paying down the carbon debt, removing one and a half trillion tons, we absolutely need these engineered and industrialized solutions. We need everything. Right. Um, but yes, what the market is asking for right now in terms of like enterprise companies mm. is they're looking for the more permanent stuff because they're self-interested to solve their own individual problems right. first and foremost. And yeah. I hear that and I want to come back to that point and just about that last piece about so the companies are demanding this and I just want to double click that like why Microsoft would believe let's say just some corporation because I don't want to speak to their motivations sure um, why a corporation would believe that these industrial methods are superior 
to what is being framed as nature-based solutions? It's because of how long they believe that the carbon can be stored. So carbon that's going into soil, if you plow that field, that carbon is going right back up in the air. And so we have like uh, an insurance policy and we have contracts in place that require the farmers to do it. And if they don't do it, then they get blackballed from the market and so on. So we have like um, sort of contractual and cultural obligations in place to keep that carbon in the ground. But that's not the same thing as the carbon turning into rock. Right. And so, but they're answering it, but not to SEC compliance in that regard. Correct. What they're answering to is reputational risk mm -hmm. of, we <laughs> don't want to say that we're net zero. And then someone says, well, how are you net zero? And you say, well, we bought this offset from this farmer, mm -hmm. or we bought this offset from this forest. You don't want the journalists going to that farmer, going to that forest, going, look, they plowed last season. Yeah. Or look, that forest actually just got susceptible to a, a, a fire yeah. and those trees aren't there anymore. And they're managing to that reputation risk mm -hmm. more so than some, let's call it ecological lens that says, yeah, actually what the planet needs right now is higher throughput of nature-based solutions mm -hmm. and we from an ecological lens would rather prioritize given only an option of one of the two not to say that we don't need it all we'd actually rather prioritize these nature-based solutions that's not the calculus and the logic no. of the system mm -hmm. design no yeah it's not but something like our blended ton can actually serve their needs and I think yeah also better serve the needs. i think it's a really creative idea and i yeah i resonate with the approach of like bring soil bring carbon to the soil now and help with this permanent solution as well. Um, I guess, you know, do you believe that the compliance side of this is what's going to ultimately drive the the, mm. the logic in the future where it's not going to be as much of this like, oh, we're scared of the Guardian. It's like, actually, this is what the SEC is mandating. And so therefore, you yeah. know, these are the standards and we're going to play by this game. And then that set of decisions of which methodology is actually more controlled by the regulatory bodies rather than the voluntary buyers? Maybe. Like the, the SEC's like climate disclosure rule, uh, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but it appears quite unconstitutional to me. <laughs> um, that's not the remit of the SEC. Mm -hmm. um, if Congress were to act and, and start requiring something like that, then totally different story, right? Mm -hmm. um, It's so difficult to imagine um, some sort of coalescing uh, regulatory requirement because the understanding of what is good versus not as high quality, what, how do you do measurement and verification? Like these are rapidly evolving and changing um, uh, paradigms mm. that like as a startup we can barely keep up with mm -hmm. good luck to the regulators like mm. who have many other different aspects of their job that they have to do mm -hmm. and it, it's like on the one hand it does see it does seem sort of like inevitable like of course something is going to happen at the regulatory mm. level but mm. i just i just don't see how it happens right now because the path to that requires that we are that we have a much better understanding of the science than we are currently capable of doing. And I also don't necessarily believe that that's going to happen anytime in the near future. So if any policies were to be put in place, mm. how would they even do it? It's much more a mechanical issue than it is like a desire or even political issue, because I do mm -hmm. think that there are ways that you could get something going through in a um, in a bipartisan sort of way. We've oh, There is actually a, um, a Senate bill from a couple of years ago called the Growing Climate Solutions Act, which is mm. around soil carbon and trying to support farmers in the US doing that. And that was broadly bipartisan. Um, when it comes to uh, corporate management, there's also a bigger question too of like, how much should they be allowed to offset or remove versus how much should they be required to decarbonize? How do you determine that at an individual level, at, at a, sorry, at a corporate level, at a, an industry level? Like th these are really difficult decisions. And mm. we can also look to examples in the past of like California's cap and trade market, which we kind of alluded to earlier around these emissions trading schemes. It doesn't actually 
pull any carbon out of the air. It doesn't actually avoid carbon emissions. Mm. What it does is it creates revenue for the state to then go implement other sort of sustainability related policies. Fine, okay, but a lot of people think that it is actually about avoiding carbon. Mm. And it has all of these other sort of negative unintended consequences from Why that Why is it that it doesn't remove carbon and that it just creates this shuffling of money? Well, um, the way that it works is the um, there are regulated industries, so it's like energy production, transportation, and that sort of thing. And it's you know that's also a political thing. Like here in Washington, the timber industry was exempted. Uh, and so what happens is they're given a certain number of allowances by the mm. state, and they say this is how much carbon or greenhouse gas you're allowed to emit every single year. If you need more than this, you can go buy more allowances from anyone who has a surplus. And mm. we'll also, as the government, we'll auction off some every quarter as well. Mm. And uh, if you need to, uh, if you need some extra time, you can bank, if you have extra surplus today, you can bank them. You could use those next year. They're not just gonna go to waste right now. Mm. Um, and also we're responsible for estimating and choosing what is the right amount of allowances to give to you for free. Mm. Of course, that's impossible to do. So there is a naturally a surplus of uh, allowances that are circulating in this market. Also, if you are a company who has a surplus and you're allowed to bank them, why on earth would you ever sell them to anyone else? So the cap is the amount that you're given and the trade is supposed to be trading the surplus, but no one actually trades. And so when we look at the prices of those allowances, they just go up on a step function every year because there's a price floor that the government has put in place. Then it gets worse because if you are one of those companies and you have this you know, target that you're supposed to hit, you are allowed to go out and buy voluntary carbon offsets that have been approved by the registry that California pairs with. Mm -hmm. If you're a sustainability person at an energy company and you have the option of buying allowances from the state, or buying offsets that you can then send a marketing team to, you can create some collateral from it, you can you know, impact local jobs, and you can make commercials around how you're helping you know, solve this thing in the community. Mm -hmm. Which one would you choose? Mm -hmm. And so because of that, they put a cap on, I think it's at like 4% now, of how many of the emissions you're allowed to meet from doing that. So if you are buying those, there's the price floor for the, the allowances from the state, and then you're willing to pay some premium over that for the offsets, but it's not like forever. So there is some ceiling to that as well. Mm. So this floor ends up acting as a ceiling for the price of offsets. So I think this is the sort of accidental pernicious effect of cap and trade is it actually holds prices down on wow. offsets so right. that we can't create a greater incentive for more people to remove and avoid carbon emissions. Mm. So uh, I, cap and trade is a terrible idea. It does not work in practice. All mm. it does is raise revenue for the government. And the thing is, when you look at like, how do they get that sort of program passed politically, they have to do it with the support of like the oil and gas industry. Mm. These companies love it because they know that it doesn't affect them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't have to change their status quo mm -hmm. really in any way, shape, or form. They they and they're big enough where they can afford the like lawyers and whatever they have to do to comply. So it's um it, it's a it's a total um yeah uh, totally bad implementation of policy um, that does not produce the result that people expect it to. Got it. Well, thanks for, for thanks for that commentary on cap and trade and I, I had interrupted you was there a broader point that you were getting to it yeah. was specifically about the fact that oil and gas companies will go along with a policy like that because right. they know it doesn't impact them and so that's another thing when it comes to thinking about like national or even god forbid international level policy mm. around mm. this stuff it's not going to happen unless you have the broad support of industry as well and right. they're only going to support things that they know are not going to actually impact them right right Fascinating. Well, I I so appreciate this education. Uh, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> I you know my questions have probably been meandering a little bit all over the place because I'm trying to kind of grope in the dark at times of how to make sense of this space. And mm -hmm. you clearly have thought through it and have a lot of experience and context. So I think your voice is is very important. Um, and yeah, I think that. Uh, if people are still kind of hanging on here, I hope that one, they are taken away that there's a lot of complexity. Um, and I guess that, you know, <laughs> one reaction to that complexity is to just turn it all off. 
But I think another reaction to that complexity is to still like stay with the trouble here and say like, yes, but we really got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, let's kind of really stick with it. Um, but just to kind of summarize what I've heard in, in total of your message, it sounds to me like you're saying, you know, top level frame, we need to reduce our emissions mm -hmm. and we need to be thinking about how do we, we need to be acting on how do we sequester carbon that we've already emitted in the atmosphere out. As quickly as possible. As quickly as possible. And looking at that from a parts per million perspective. Mm -hmm. And so as an individual actor, priority one, decarbonize, you know, reduce emissions, look for opportunities, whether it's at an individual level or at a company level. Can I say, I, actually, I don't think individuals should care about it, frankly. I think that they're um, like some, something like 70% of all carbon emissions are caused by like 50 companies. So uh, you as an individual, like we live in a system where we mm -hmm. are uh, bound to, right. uh, you know, the way our energy is produced, the gasoline that our cars are burning and the jet fuel that our planes are flying in. And, and um, also right. we eat food, which is like land use is 20% of all carbon emissions. Cement is like three and a half percent. Like mm. we as individuals cannot impact that. So our, our opportunity is not, oh, stop flying. Our opportunity is put pressure on the companies through our purchasing power mm -hmm. to decarbonize as quickly mm -hmm. as possible. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Plus, start businesses that solve real problems. Right. So, okay. So I appreciate that clarification. So priority one, decarbonize, but really focusing on the, the large emitters, mm -hmm. the, the, the big corporations that are doing this. And then step two is you know, after or simultaneous to that reduction of emissions, it's to sequester and to purchase these offsets or these credits um, to ensure that we're bringing financial value into other parts of the ecosystem so that step three, we're favoring first and foremost, the, the throughput of the moment, mm -hmm. the nature-based nature -based solutions. We need to be bringing carbon into soil. We need to be planting trees. We need to be conserving forests. We need to be bringing it into you know, blue carbon, ocean solutions, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're currently also incubating and standing up and financing and building this new industry that will be the carbon commodity like markets, mm -hmm. um, because this is actually a multi-trillion, multi-decade, multi-century permanent aspect of civilization, the new waste management, you yeah. know, bolt on kind of mentality, which is to say that we need to clean up and take care of the consequences of 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 carbon carbon emissions in our atmosphere. You got it. Yeah. That's any it. any other it's key? easy, right? Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it's not, <laughs> it's not we do, we do things as humans that probably are far more complicated than this. Um, yes, but we've never done them so quickly. And that's the, the, the challenge of it. We've never done it so quickly and so intentionally, like we're really good at self-organizing and, um, like the, the enlightenment and rationality mm. and cap like markets and, and capitalism generally, these are all things that have produced like wonders of the world. And mm. we, we all live far, far better than the most powerful people in the world did a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, that didn't come about with that sort of intentionality. And it also didn't come about with a sort of Damocles hanging over our heads. Yeah. And so there is a greater challenge to the fact that this has to be done. Um, as rapidly as possible, but I will say, I'm extremely optimistic. I mean, mm. if you look at like on the venture side of things, it's more than 15%, even up to 20% of all venture dollars are going into climate tech now. Mm. And like I said, when wow. when fusion comes online, like the entire game is going to change and everything, we're, we're basically going to have super abundant free energy. And energy is by far the most important predictor of like human success and human um, uh, capital creation. Mm. So uh, we just have to continue to like push as quickly as we can, buy ourselves more time and continue building these tools out. We mm. absolutely have the capability of solving climate change 
um, much, much sooner than I think most people believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of those market forces are already in motion. So I'm like really optimistic. Things are mm -hmm. very, very different now from in 2023 from where they were when I first started exploring this problem myself sure. in 2015. There was no refi. Climate tech was, was not even a glimmer yeah. in most VCs' eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so things are moving and then we'll get on to, to world peace after that. But, uh, but yeah. for now, climate change. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you. All right. What do you think of that conversation with Paul? Obviously, there is a lot there. One thing that really stood out to me was how he kept coming back to all of the above. We need to do all of the actions because the situation is that dire and demands it. And I think that's important because it underpins the logic and decisions being made around things like industrial scale carbon removal. To learn more about Nori, go to nori.com. You might also be interested in the conversations we had with Rez from Solid World, Diego Size Gill from Pachama, and Troy Carter from Earthshot Labs. You can find all of those conversations and more at maearth.com. Please like, share, subscribe, join our community discord and engage with us this is season one of The Regeneration Will Be Funded. We'd love to hear what you think. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.